Okay, it is noon and we're going to begin. We're going to honor everybody's time and um, we have a lot to cover today and we're just again so happy that so many of you could join us. Uh, we are we are a team here at Overlake, but we're, we're talking to you from three different locations. We've got Dr. Dave Knopfler in his office, uh, our CEO Mike Marsh in his, and then the foundation crew in turn in uh, are over here in the foundation offices. This is allowing our speakers to present without masks and you can get a better look at their handsome faces. Uh, be, so I'm going to turn it over to Mike, our C, the CEO of Overlake, to get us going and, um, and then we'll continue on with our program. So Mike, take it away. All right, well, let me um, add my welcome to this uh, great circle of excellence event. Um, before I begin with just introducing our guest speaker, I want to thank uh, all of you for your interest in this topic, but also for your support of Overlake. Uh, um, there are um, many familiar names on the list of individuals that we have joining us today. I think we had something on the order of about 60 or so individuals sign up for this event. And there are a lot of new names too, which is wonderful to see. Um, Overlake wouldn't be the organization that it is today without the the level of interest and support that we receive from our community and the people like uh, individuals who are on the call today. Um, what you may not know is that um, Overlake was really on the front line of this uh, epidemic. Uh, we were literally the uh, portion of the country that experienced COVID with any scale uh, uh, first. Uh, the East East King County, uh, out of 112 hospitals in the state, Overlake is one of only nine hospitals designated by the center, the CDC, uh, as a high impact hospital. Only a precious few hospitals across the country were designated as high impact hospitals based on the level of disease that we experienced here at Overlake, especially in the early portion of the of the disease. Um, you know, the, the successes and the teamwork and the change management that we've experienced here has been really uh, in, inspiring. What we've learned over the last six months has made us uh, incredibly prepared if we are to experience a fall and winter surge. Hopefully, we'll be able to talk a little bit about that today. But, um, you know, whether we're talking about how we managed our personal protective equipment, the fact that we were one of only four hospitals in the state to set up a molecular lab to improve our supply chain around testing, one of the first hospitals to be in our clinical trial around remdesivir, the support that we've given to our employee health with an infection rate of only 1.3%, uh, which is an incredibly low rate, uh, 51 employees out of um, 3,200 employees. Uh, have been infected with COVID. Uh, all of that we believe was community acquired, precious few exposures, uh, resources, emotional support resources in our high impact areas like our cohorts, our ICU, our EDs, our respiratory clinics. Uh, the organization, what's, what's, what's been described and maybe not fully understood is the operational and financial toll that COVID is taking on hospitals. Uh, for a host of reasons that we can speak to, to the extent that the, the group has interest in it later as we get into uh, Q&A, but it's enormous, it's historic, and uh, we're taking care of very sick individuals with uh, a lot of resource intensity, and at a time when uh, it draws people away from healthcare, uh, when it should be, uh, and in, in, in some cases where people should be accessing healthcare, they're delaying health care, so they're showing up at our doors much, much sicker. Uh, in the meantime, during all of this COVID that we've experienced, uh, we've still remained uh, open to the public uh, across all of the many disciplines that we uh, we support. And, you know, we talk a lot about COVID. We're, that's the whole topic today. But, uh, you know, 95% of what we've been done over the last six months has been related to cardiac surgery, neurosurgery, stroke care, cancer care, uh, care that's related to every 
uh, part of the human condition uh, has still had to be maintained and supported during that time. And we're really proud to say that um, we've been able to do that in a way that has continued to elevate the standard that we're accustomed to. So with those few introductory remarks, I, I have the great pleasure of introducing uh, an amazing chief medical officer and a dear friend, uh, Dr. Dave Knopfler. Uh, Dr. Knopfler is a Bellevue boy. There's just no other way to put it. Uh, he is a native of Bellevue. He grew up here. Uh, he's been at Overlake uh, since 1983 when he started as a volunteer in the emergency department before joining the medical staff in 1993. Uh, he was in private practice for seven years and uh, his dad, also a physician, were the first father and son uh, uh, duo to work at Overlake. After college, uh, he didn't go straight to medical school. Dave uh, joined Boeing and he worked as a programmer, working in uh, automating some of the programming symptom, uh, systems on the 757 and 767. And he decided that humans were a little more interesting than airplanes. And so he decided to go to medical school. Uh, Dave is a champion of quality and safety. Uh, I couldn't be more fortunate to have such a talented individual on my executive team serving as our chief medical officer. He's been at the front line since the very first call came in. He came in probably somewhere around midnight when we discovered our first, uh, our first COVID patient on February 28th. He was here all night long and 24 hours all the rest of the day as he was helping to stand up the command center with many others working shoulder to shoulder with him. I think that might have been the day I see Carl Benke's on the call. That might have been the, the day that that I had uh, just come back from uh, dinner at Carl's house. Carl, I'm not blaming COVID on you, but uh, I know that it was very close to the time that uh, we were talking about what might happen with COVID. And sure enough, uh, we shouldn't we shouldn't have uttered those words because I'm sure it brought the uh, the, pl the pox upon us. So uh, after our presentation, um, there'll be time for questions for Dave or I. And, uh, and but before uh, I turn it over to Dave, um, I do want to uh, actually ask Katie Sims, who works in Molly's area, to just talk a little bit about the logistics of the call and how we'll be managing it. And again, I just want to end with my sincere gratitude to all of you for joining this uh, presentation and for supporting Overlake. Katie. Thank you so much, Mike, and thank you all for joining us. Before we get started, I just have a few logistics to share with you. And because we have so many people joining this webinar, um, we have had you all put you all on mute to begin. And we received several questions during the res registration process. There will be time at the end of the presentation, as Mike said, um, for those questions to be answered. You also have um, a chat feature in the presentation that you can submit questions to us during the, the talk today. To open the chat box, there's a chat icon at the bottom of your screen that you'll want to click on. It will pop up a chat window on the right-hand side of your screen, and you can choose to send your question to everyone or just to us, the hosts here at um, Overlake. If you are calling in and you have questions, you can still um, submit those via email to the email address that was provided in your confirmation email, which was jennifer.fisher at overlakehospital.org. And since we're all on video, if you turned your video on, please try not to share anything on your video feed that you do not want anyone else on the call to see. We are just asking that you be mindful of your surroundings um, because we are recording this presentation. After the presentation is over, we will be loading this um, as a YouTube video onto the Foundation's um, YouTube site. And then with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Knopfler. Great. Thank you, Katie. Uh, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yeah, good. All right. I'm going to try to uh, be technical here and share my content. So just if you bear with me for just a sec. Uh, is that visible for everybody? Good to go. All right. Um, so uh, first off, uh, we did get all the questions and I really tried to gear the presentation to uh, the questions that came in. Obviously, I want to cover all the background uh, 
as well, but you guys did an amazing job of uh, covering uh, this from A to Z. So it, it, there's a fair amount of material. I'll try to do the best my, I can to get through it in the time allotted. Um, first off, I want to say that um, we'll all remember the year 2020, just the way our grandparents and great-grandparents remembered 1918. Uh, this, this will be a forever year for us because uh, these are permanent changes in some ways, not, not in all ways, but some, some ways. So I won't go through the list of topics here, but we'll, this is uh, the overview of where we're going today. So uh, thank you for having me here. I'm excited to be able to uh, see you all um, and uh, hopefully have some conversation. So as we move into, oh, pardon me, I see I got to get my, my system down here. There we go. Uh, I'm going to start out with Overlake's experience with COVID. Mike uh, summarized incredibly well how this uh, came on and, and the impact of it. Um, since the uh, beginning of uh, this COVID uh, pandemic, we have tested, uh, when I did the slide, it's about 16,500 individuals. It's now over 17,000. Uh, we've had uh, about 5.7% um, uh, of those turn out positive. Uh, I, I will comment on the weaker male sex and that more men turn up positive than, than women, um, and that is borne out nationally as well. Uh, something about the male sex seems to uh, make us a little more likely to um, be positive. We've treated a total of 252 patients in the hospital, um, and currently our, our COVID census, that we see, and I did the slide just days ago, had been running around 8 to 11, but it's actually dropped back down a little bit back into that 2 to 5 range. So. We, we're seeing some ebbing and flowing of our numbers here, um, but we have drifted back down, which is obviously very good news. Uh, in terms of patient uh, deaths, uh, we did have uh, 48. Uh, the really uh, uh, wonderful part about that, if there is such a thing, is that we've had none since May, since the end of May, beginning of June. So uh, we've had folks that aren't quite as ill, but we've also gotten our treatment uh, regimens down extraordinarily well. Um, and with some of the newer medications uh, that are coming out, that's making a difference. And I'll be covering those as well. One thing that we're extraordinarily proud of is that once a patient reaches our intensive care unit is on a ventilator, which obviously uh, indicates that they're very critically ill, um, our uh, mortality rate is about 40%. That's far, far under the national rate, which has been around 70%. Now, the, the good, there's good news there as well. Is, is everyone is standardizing treatment and understanding the optimal way to manage a very sick COVID patient, the mortality is falling nationally as well. Uh, so uh, we, we did a great job at the get-go, and thankfully the rest of the nation is, is catching up with us uh, in terms of those excellent treatment protocols. And then lastly, Mike touched on this, and this is really important, is we've had only, I believe, it's actually 52 now today, uh, positive employees, and that is an extraordinarily low number. Um, uh, Mike mentioned, I think, Mike, well, I believe it was 1.3 or 1.4 percent uh, positive, and that, that is vastly lower than the norm nationally. And of those employees, we've had no deaths. We've only had one hospitalization, which was brief. Uh, and in fact, in the last um, six to eight weeks, the only positive employees we've had have been from outside uh, exposures. We've had no staff-to-staff -staff or patient-to-staff exposures, which is, again, a real testament to uh, our practices here around screening and masking and just being uh, safe. Um, so that, that gives you some flavor of where we are uh, as of a couple of days ago. I think looking at, at the timeline is also helpful uh, because it points out a couple other features of COVID. So if you look, this is a, a timeline beginning back in February when uh, this all started. And the light blue line is our positive COVID testing numbers. The blue, darker blue line is our admissions and the red line is our deaths. And the reason I put arrows on there is you can see there's about a two-week window between each of those arrows. So, for example, at the first um, um, uh, outbreak back in March or end of February and March, you can see uh, about every two weeks you saw uh, positives turn into admissions, admissions turned into to deaths. Um, it's a little different, as, as you notice now. As we get into July, you see that our, our positive rate went up. Our admissions went up a little bit, but not our deaths. And I'll, I'll discuss why that is, but it's a number of factors, including the fact that it's a much younger age group that is now uh, turning up positive with COVID, and also that we've got our treatment regimens down. Uh, one other thing to mention about this is that um, there's a lot of what I would call microcultures uh, when it relates to this. We often talk about countries 
uh, and then when we want to get more specific, we talk about state. But in reality, uh, it's very, very local. So, for example, uh, I don't know if any of you saw it, there was an article, I believe, in the Seattle Times uh, just this week that talked about the fact that on the east side up north, Woodenville, Bothell, North Kirkland, they're seeing an increasing rate, whereas Bellevue's seeing a decreasing rate. So, again, this can be a very local uh, process. And in all honesty, where we're at now, a couple of uh, parties that, um, uh, a couple of parties with a large number of unmasked people uh, who are in a crowded situation can uh, dramatically change the numbers. I just saw the comment. I'm trying to move the box here. This, uh, give me just a sec. See if I can I can change this a little bit. Uh, it's not wanting to move for me. No, I'm not having luck. I'm sorry. I'll I'll try to try to make sure that I. Uh, acknowledge what's under the um, slide if it's, if it's important. Uh, as we move into testing, I just wanted to do a, a brief background to make sure everyone understands the, the world of testing for COVID. There's three uh, basic ways that you can do this. The first is something called PCR, and I won't go into the technical details because it's, it's actually extraordinarily complex. It's one of the most common testing methods, but really what it's looking for is fragments of the viruses genes, and those are in a, what's called RNA versus human DNA, so these viruses use RNA. The second is an antibody, so that's looking for your body's response to the virus, and that's another test that is gradually um, becoming more popular, although it's not particularly useful at the time you become ill because it takes several weeks to turn positive, and in some cases there's suspicions that in, in certain individuals that may never turn positive or be very weakly positive. And then the last, which is actually the, the real gold standard, is, some, is, is actually culturing live virus. And the unfortunate thing is that's very complex. It takes quite a while to uh, do. And so we don't typically do these cultures uh, unless you're in a research environment. Um, so unlike bacteria, where you can often grow them out in a matter of days uh, and sometimes even in hours, uh, with viral cultures, there, it's a very different situation. So then as we look at these tests, uh, we always have to ask ourselves, what, what does it mean? What does a positive test mean? And I put the word sensitivity there, which is really about, does this test come up with what's called a false negative? In other words, you have the disease, you do the test, but the test comes up negative. We know that the, the main test that we do, which is the PCR test, is very sensitive. Um, and in fact, when, when it, we do get false negatives, it usually has to do with the technique of collecting the sample, not the test itself. And it still remains the, the standard. Um, uh, in terms of timing, um, again, you will uh, frequently have the presence of that RNA if you do the PCR test even before you're sick. Um, and uh, it will persist often for four to six days. Uh, most people, it becomes negative around that six day uh, point, but not in everybody. And then the real, the real question, of course, is, does any of, what does this mean in terms of immunity? And that really has to do with the antibody testing. And I wish I had a uh, more, more comprehensive answer for you, but we do feel that the presence of antibody does uh, give you uh, immunity at that point. Uh, it's unclear at this point how long it lasts. There's, we're starting to have enough time between the beginning of the pandemic and now that uh, there's a sense it will persist at least six months. And uh, but again, until we get a year or two out, it's going to be very hard to make any uh, firm statements around testing and how long immunity um, is indicated by a positive antibody. Uh, I do want to touch a little bit on resources and materials. Uh, we um, initially, like everyone else, had a little bit of a struggle around uh, certain uh, uh, supplies, in particular masks, were probably the, the single greatest uh, concern. Um, I, I want to thank uh, every one of you, if you were part of it, and our entire community, because uh, our community uh, pulled us through. There's no question that the donations that occurred uh, with masks in particular just made a world of difference. And so, uh, it, it, again, I just can't thank everyone enough for uh, coming in and making these donations. Uh, I can say that uh, we were, have always been well situated in terms of ventilators. We did even get a few more just to be sure that we had enough backup. But as, as of now, we're very, very confident that um, we would make it through the rest of this year, uh, even if things uh, picked up uh, significantly. 
Uh, throughout the state, there's getting to be better supplies as well. Uh, I, don't, I haven't seen anything recently about any of the hospitals in the state being down to critically low supplies. But uh, needless to say, if things really picked up, we uh, would um, uh, be very careful how we use the supplies. We've loosened up now and are allowing uh, our staff to uh, not be quite as conservative as they were in how they uh, use uh, certain pieces of equipment. The other thing that has just been wonderful is we have a very inventive and imaginative community with a lot of 3D printing capability. And uh, we had a number of uh, uh, companies locally that uh, diverted their uh, production line and actually began manufacturing supplies for us. This was uh, really most uh, helpful in the area of respirators um, where we had um, all, all sorts of uh, materials uh, produced for us that uh, gave us uh, a really uh, solid supply uh, for the respirators. So I mean, that's, that's the hard supplies. I, we can't forget that human resources are critical as well. I put providers and nurses here, but obviously it goes well, you know, way beyond that. Uh, you know, everyone at the hospital had, had a role in, in keeping patients safe and making sure that uh, we met our, our community obligations. Uh, we did, however, work very hard in the area of uh, physicians and nurses to make sure that we had uh, backup in place, that we had uh, individuals who could cover day and night, um, and that really was a rallying point for, for uh, everybody to step up. And, you know, we had physicians who sometimes had very little presence in the hospital uh, come back and say, I'm willing to help out uh, and, um, you know, maybe take the, the lower uh, severity illness patients, for example. So uh, it really made a big difference. The last uh, thing I want to touch on here is about cohorting, and the reason it's under resources and materials is that cohorting of the COVID patients is a way to uh, really save on supplies. And uh, the reason that it makes such a difference is that you can put on your mask or respirator, your gloves, your gown, and as long as you stay in the cohort, everyone has the same disease, which is COVID you don't have to change them. Now, you would change them if they ever became soiled or had, had splash on them, but uh, by and large, um, people were able to wear those for most of the day. The traditional way of handling that is that you use one of these every time you go in and out of the room. And so uh, by cohorting, we were able to drastically reduce our use of equipment. Uh, pardon me? Here it goes. Um, so in terms of um, keeping everyone safe and, and screening and visitor management, I do want to touch on this. We do perform screening on every single person that enters the institution. doesn't matter whether they're employees, visitors, uh, patients, staff, uh, vendors, you name it. Um, we ask everyone about symptoms, and we use a no-touch infrared thermometer to check their temperature, just what you see on the news in some airports and uh, other places. Um, that has been effective, and, you know, people are very honest. Uh, we really have had uh, uh, very little signs that there's deception or people denying symptoms when they have them. Um, I want to touch on the visitors a little bit because there can be misunderstandings at time, and people do get frustrated because they want to see their loved one uh, when they're in the hospital. But we found that if we carefully explained to everybody why we're doing what we're doing, which is limiting the number of visitors, uh, really not having any children in the hospital, uh, having them go through the screening process, offering them a mask if they don't have it, they understand that it's really for their safety, their loved one's safety, and everyone else's safety. And so, uh, by and large, we really haven't had too much trouble. Um, we do have an occasional person who isn't particularly happy, but um, it, it has not led to any of the, the you know, situations that are worthy of videos on the news. We, we find that we can be very uh, reasonable and rational with people, and they respond. Uh, we do make exceptions to some of these rules, not around the masking, but around the numbers. Um, and that's folks who are really you know, actively dying on comfort care. If someone has a caregiver that is essential uh, for, the, for the, their health and mental health while they're in the hospital, we'll make an exception. Or if we see some other patient benefit that's clearly um, in play, if we were to have more than one visitor, we, we will make exceptions. I love this picture. So um, it's under the, the heading of protecting patients, visitors, and, and staff. And you know the famous statement: "A picture is worth a thousand words." And this is this is the reality of the situation. Uh, the the upper left is 
is obviously the worst possible scenario. And I'm going to put a little guide here I just popped up that says what the masking situation is. So you can see that's with nothing uh, and a sneeze. Um, the upper right is a single layer of cloth. You can still see a lot of droplet uh, there. Uh, the lower left is a double layer of cloth. That looks pretty good, but you can still see a few droplets. And then last on the lower right is a surgical mask. And that's actually a, sort of a little bit of a mist, which is actually an aerosol, um, but it's not droplet. And, and really, you worry much more about the droplets. They travel much further. And COVID, uh, although there has been controversy at times about droplet versus aerosol, is vastly more likely to be a droplet transmitted uh, organism unless you're in a very confined uh, place. So uh, this, this is a very strong argument, obviously, for um, the use of masks, and in particular, surgical masks. One other piece of science is, is here, and again, I apologize that uh, we're losing the left upper corner, but don't worry about the pictures. Um, there's so many different types of masking out there, and it you know, ranges from the real surgical mask, or what's called an N95, which is the gold standard, to bandanas and fleece. Um, but other things fall into this. You know, eye protection is, is important, especially if you're in a confined space. Um, and then, you know, I just, I'll always mention socially distancing and, avoid, socially distancing and avoiding crowds. Um, those two things uh, play an enormous role in transmission, and uh, they play a big role in what's happening now in the younger age groups, which I'll touch on in just a second. Uh, to give you an idea here, too, um, and uh, again, I apologize, you can't quite see the tops of these two right um, uh, bars, but uh, I can tell you that when, com when you compare the protection or the number of droplets there are in each of these situations, what you really want to look at is, the, is what I've colored green here, which is these are the masks that clearly give you the most protection. And uh, that's, you know, an N95 fitted, which is, again, the gold standard. Surgical masks do very well. Uh, some of these others are more in the medical world than out, you know, that you'd buy at Home Depot or a pharmacy. But even some of these cotton masks do okay. They're not, they're not as good as a surgical mask, but they're not too bad. On the other hand, when you get out to things like scars, knitted scars, nothing, or even fleece, you can see that the number of droplets is, is anywhere from 10 to 15 times higher. And you saw that in that, that picture that I just showed. Um, one fascinating piece of the study was that fleece was actually worse than nothing. And what it appears is that these fleece masks actually create even more droplet and aerosol than if you have nothing on. So uh, it's, you know, it's not really um, providing you or anyone else a benefit to pull up a scarf or wear a knitted um, scarf or even a bandana. It's just not uh, giving you protection. So you can tell I'm clearly advocating for going out and buying surgical masks if you want to be serious about protecting yourself and others. Uh, this, this, I titled it Forecasting Models. There's always a lot of questions about what's going to happen, and um, there's several really good lessons about forecasting in the world of microbiology and disease, and they're very analogous to hurricanes. And uh, what it comes down to is if you rely on one forecast, you're never going to be right. And so what, what we do uh, with this is the exact same do, thing we now do with hurricanes, which is do what are called ensemble forecasts. So you're taking every model that anyone has created and plotting them together. And just like the famous crowdsourcing term that we use for things like if you take 100 people and ask them all to guess someone's weight, the average is almost always spot on. Pretty much you're going to hit, hit it right if you eyeball this and say, ah, it's somewhere in the middle. So on the left here, you see for the entire United States, uh, I did this about a week ago, and you can see that the number of new deaths, if you were to take the most common right in the middle, probably is going to remain about the same. It's, you know, it's probably unlikely, barring something radically changing, to go up dramatically. Unfortunately, you can't see the one under the upper right, but that's all right, the Washington. Um, it's, it's about the same as Florida down here um, in that there's a, a widespread, but again, if you take the average, it looks pretty much like we're going to see the same number of new cases over the next several weeks. Now, what's the problem with models? The problem with models are that you're, you're making assumptions, and that leads into many questions that uh, we got ahead of time around school and university. Uh, right now, it's felt that the, the resumption of school or university um, is probably the biggest variable in this whole predictive uh, uh, process, and 
Uh, I think, you know, if you've read the news lately, you've seen a couple of universities that have already started, uh, Notre Dame, uh, Maine, University of North Carolina, some of the California schools, where within one to two weeks of bringing uh, students back on campus, they immediately had outbreaks that made them switch back to virtual uh, uh, instruction. And I think that's a, that's a real strong warning of the difficulty with having large numbers of young people in small spaces. University is even more challenging because there's a lot of extracurricular activity. A number of those universities ran into trouble not because of classrooms, but because of uh, parties and other social events that were occurring outside of uh, the instructional um, realm. So uh, I would, based on the models, I would say as long as we're careful about not bringing too many students together, whether that's elementary, junior high, high school, or even university, we'll probably see the number of new deaths roughly stay the same. All right, uh, switching gear, there were several questions about travel as well. And uh, in terms of travel, it's really, there's three things you need to think about. One is the risk assessment, and I would just call that doing your homework. Uh, and that's, you know, what do I look at? How do I predict my risk if I go to a, a specific destination? And we'll talk about that. Next is up, what is, what's your risk tolerance? And, th and that's really about, um, what underlying risk factors do you have? Age, other medical conditions, are you on medications that could put you at higher risk? And then last is risk mitigation. How do I lower my risk given everything else? And we'll talk about that as well. In, in the area of risk, uh, I'm sorry, I started with risk tolerance here. When you think about risk tolerance and, and, uh, and assessment, I guess in this case, um, you know, you need to clearly look at where you're going. So we have, there's a lot of data out on the internet now about uh, the rates of COVID in various countries, if not states, if you're gonna stay domestic. But you know, what's coming into play now is who will even allow you in? Uh, there was a headline recently in one of the papers that basically said, US passport worthless. And you know, that's not far off the truth at this point. Uh, there are majority of countries right now in the world, including all of the European Union, really don't allow any U.S. travelers. If you have very um, uh, pertinent business interests, you can sometimes uh, get in, but otherwise, just for regular travel, you really can't uh, go most destinations. Uh, within the U.S., uh, it's important to assess risk. There are states within the U.S. that probably are as high or higher risk than almost anywhere else in the world right now, and uh, they they do span across the southernmost part of the country. I will say the good news is, especially the last week, is that even in those states, the numbers do seem to be uh, going down. Another thing to consider is uh, testing. There, there are uh, states and countries that uh, will allow you to bring a test if it's been done within 48 hours of travel. But uh, what's interesting about that is that you may arrive and still be told no. There's just countless examples of that. In fact, Hawaii for a while said if you have a test within 48 hours and bring it with you, they'll let you in. And we had a number of individuals who said that it didn't work. As soon as I got there, they told me I had to be retested and stay in 14 days of quarantine. So unless you're going to be there longer than 14 days, uh, your vacation was pretty much uh, done for. Uh, let's move a little bit into the assessing risk here. Um, this, I apologize again, this can't be seen real well. But um, what I'm trying to demonstrate here, and I have a couple more graphs that you will be able to see, is that percentage of positive tests, which is the blue line, is really felt to be one of the most predictive uh, factors out there. And this is for the state of Washington. And what you see, you can just barely see the scale on the right, is that our percentage of positive tests is about 5%. If you compare that to California, um, theirs is about 7 or 8%. Obviously, they're doing a lot more testing than us as a big state. But overall, their percentage of positives is only marginally higher than uh, Washington. On the other hand, if you look at Arizona, you can see that their positive test rate is still very high at over 20% and had been almost as high as 30%, which is considered extraordinarily high risk. So I'm, I give this as an example of doing your homework uh, in terms of your intended destination. I would strongly recommend that you look at your destination and try to ascertain uh, what the positive test rate is. That is highly predictive of, of the risk in traveling there. The other thing you can look at is something called r naught. Don't worry about the, the symbol there or the, the, this looks very mathematical. Basically, it's just the reproductive factor and it's, it's a lot simpler than it seems. 
All it means is that if you have a reproductive factor of one, it means for every person who gets disease, on average, they transmit it to one person. So anything under one means that the disease is fading away, and anything over one means that it's actually growing. And you can see in Washington that we're just a tad over one. This is a little dated here. It's actually now down closer to one. If we compare ourselves again to California, California, even though they have a fair number of cases, have gotten themselves finally under one, which means that uh, the disease is slowly uh, diminishing. And if you look at Arizona, despite their very high numbers and the positive test rate, they've also gotten themselves down under one, which is a good prognostic factor. So again, these are the types of things you would look at uh, before you travel to uh, assess the risk at your destination. Lastly, there, there is a, an awful lot you can do. And uh, before we even head down the risk mitigation, um, what I like to express is that, you know, the hospital is obviously a place where we have known COVID, and we do cohort it, um, but we follow these exact same rules that I have here around what you touch and what you breathe. And as I mentioned, we have not had a single transmission in anyone who is using careful technique and masking um, since the end of May. Um, it's been extraordinarily effective. So. In the what you touch category, and again, this isn't just for travel, this can be your day-to-day -day, uh, as well. Clearly, you want to um, do frequent hand washing, keep sanitizer with you in your car, in small bottles, wherever you go. It is absolutely worth using. Um, you want to be extraordinarily careful not to touch your eyes, nose, or mouth. Uh, if you're on the plane, obviously, you do want to wipe down the seats and the trays. Those tend to be the two things that people miss. Um, uh, and even, I didn't put it here, but seat belt has been another one that's been identified as frequently missed. Uh, the seats you want to clean. As much as I, I love uh, Alaska Airlines, I'm a huge fan. Um, I, I don't entirely trust their cleaning process or any other airline, and so I always travel with these uh, bleach wipes. Uh, eating and drinking, in all honesty, and travel, I'd recommend that you don't. I would, if you're going to, I would bring your own food uh, that's prepackaged. And, and avoid anything that they put out for you. Uh, in terms of breathing, as, as I noted in those slides previously, masking is very effective. And the likelihood of you uh, uh, contracting COVID, unless the person's in the middle seat, which is my bullet two down, um, right next to you, is very low if you properly mask and leave your mask on during the trip. So again, I can't stress strongly enough how important it is to use your mask. I do want to comment on ventilation systems, although my, my, oops, excuse me, my experience in the airline industry was back in 1983 when I worked for Boeing. Um, the, the ventilation systems are actually quite good. Um, people uh, often complain about the ventilation on a plane, but they actually uh, use a combination of taking in fresh air, about half, and then uh, putting the other half through HEPA filters, which do filter out the virus. So by and large, ventilation is not too much of a problem. The middle seat issue has to do with just proximity. Even with a great ventilation system, if somebody is two inches from you, it's pretty much impossible to avoid exposure. And although you, you can mask very effectively, if that person is literally up against you, you're gonna have a hard time uh, avoiding exposure if they were to be ill. And that's not just for COVID, that could be influenza or a variety of other uh, respiratory pathogens. So this is my way of saying, Check with your airline. I personally would never fly on an airline that's currently filling their middle seat. I just, I wouldn't do it because no matter what you do, you really could not put yourself in a safe situation. The other is a passenger without a mask. Honestly, at this point, um, if they were on the other end of the plane and I was masked, I might tolerate it, but otherwise I would certainly raise my hand, talk to the flight attendant. Uh, luckily, the airlines are being very strict about this, which they should be and uh, it's becoming a much rarer phenomenon. So. All right, I'm gonna to just touch briefly on evaluation and testing again. Um, if, you know, certainly you wanna get tested if you're symptomatic. There's a lot of people who wanna get tested just for the sake of, of getting tested, but um, really, unless you have symptoms or have had what you feel is a clear exposure, the, the test has, has limited use. Um, I mean, we all have this desire to know but I do want to stress that uh, if you turn up negative on the test and you don't have any symptoms, it's almost no, no value to you whatsoever. Um, what, what's of value
you is if you've had a significant exposure, and unfortunately in that scenario, because you won't turn up positive immediately, you almost have to wait four for sure, but even better, six days after the exposure. Um, I have false negatives written here, and again, I, I put that there because I want everyone to know that the process of being tested well, which is what's called the nasopharyngeal swab, is as scary as that picture looks. That is literally how far back that swab goes uh, into your nose. I don't want it to scare you if you need to be tested, but a sample in the front of the nose as of right now, although that's used in some places, is just not anywhere near as accurate as this nasopharyngeal swab. There's other methodologies that are coming online. We're looking at saliva and some other ways, but uh, for now, this is the absolute gold standard. All right. There were lots of questions about treatment, and so I'll spend some time here for sure. I wanted first to do a little bit of a high-level overview. Certainly, there are medications that are what we would call direct antivirals. Um, right now, um, there's only one, and I'll go in detail about that, that really has shown to lead to any improvement at all. Antibodies, obviously, your body makes antibodies, and um, that is, is ultimately what cures you of any disease, is your antibodies and, and the rest of your immune system response. There's what I would call immune system modulators. And what I mean by that right now is mainly steroids. Um, we, uh, again, if you've done any reading or watched any informational shows about COVID, uh, it's as much a disease of your own immune system going awry as it is the actual virus. And so in, in situations where you're very sick, some of these immune system modulators are very important. Uh, it's also a disease of blood clots. Uh, and so we have to prevent blood uh, blood clots, but it's through the use of blood thinners. And we do that even 30 days after the illness in very sick people. Uh, and then there's other non-medication non ways that we treat people. So that's direct treatment. On the prevention side, uh, vaccines, obviously, and, and I got, we got the most questions, I think, about vaccines as any topic, so I'll, I'll spend some time on that as well. And then questions about medications. The only thing I'll say about medications is there are none. Uh, at this point. Um, we don't have any identified medications that make a difference in terms of prevention. Uh, obviously, for a number of months, there was uh, first some hope and then some misinformation around hydroxychloroquine being uh, effective, but at this point, it's very clear. It's no, not only is it not effective, it's actually dangerous to use. So uh, really, the, the future is about vaccines. When we look at specific medications, the one that gets the most press is something called remdesivir. It is an antiviral medication. Uh, it does not lower the death rate, but what it does do is seem to shorten illness in patients who are uh, severely ill. So we don't use it typically in mildly ill uh, patients, but we do use it in those who are more moderately ill. Steroids, as I mentioned, clearly at this point uh, make a difference. Again. We don't use them in people who are mildly ill. We do use it in severely ill and critically ill patients. And they do make a difference. And they do actually make a difference in mortality, not just in shortening the disease. And then the last is what's called convalescent sera. sera. And unfortunately, it's underneath the, the box here, but it says blood plasma from survivors. And essentially, that's uh, the equivalent of giving yourself a vaccine immediately, because what you're deriving from that blood plasma is that individual's antibody. And uh, so you're immediately getting a, a, an immune response as if you'd had a form of vaccine. There is a lot of hope around convalescent sera, but there's still a lot of work to do uh, in um, uh, defining exactly who we use it in and how effective it is. I'm just going to briefly touch on non-medication positioning. We actually, uh, and this may surprise you, we do what's called prone patients. It turns out your lungs are much more efficient if you're laying on your stomach. Um, and so we will actually have patients who are able to turn themselves, um, or if they're on mechanical ventilation, we'll turn them several times a day onto their stomach. And it really makes a difference, there's no question. Uh, as we look at uh, prevention, uh, the, the vaccine uh, world is one that literally changes day by day. And I, I don't think I made this slide more than a week ago, and we've already gone from more than 100 vaccines to over 170. So that tells you how fast uh, this is increasing. In addition, I had said a week ago about four or closer than the rest moving to phase three, which is what's under the box. Uh, it's now, I think, around seven. Um, so this, this is moving very quickly. And in fact, it's just, it's absolutely um, a testament to 
where we are uh, right now in terms of technology and understanding the genetics of this virus that we're moving so quickly. The fastest vaccine that ever had been developed was from mumps, which was actually a pretty straightforward vaccine back in the 60s. Uh, many of us are old enough to remember that. Um, and it took four years. Um, you know, on the other hand, HIV, it's been 36 years and we still don't have a vaccine. It is almost for certain that we will have a, a vaccine available, at least in limited form, within six months to a year, uh, which is just astounding. There's never been a production that's occurred so quickly. And uh, I just want to spend a second about the, the vaccines because every one of them is a little different. Um, and I think that's one of the challenging uh, pieces in this is that you're not comparing two vaccines that use the same mechanism against one another. You're comparing vaccines that use completely different methods. And that's going to actually make it a little more challenging to pick out the best or the best couple. I put the picture of the virus here on the lower right because you see these little red, what are called spike proteins. One thing uh, that is consistent, however, is that every one of these vaccines is geared towards those spike proteins in some fashion uh, because they are what allow the virus to attach and enter your body. Uh, what's fascinating about the vaccine world is, is how they achieve that. And it can be something as simple as the old fashioned method. So for example, polio, well, polio in particular is, is an inactivated or really weakened virus. And so, uh, this CoronaVac, which is on here, it says dead inactivated virus, is using the old tried and true method of taking coronavirus, inactivating it, and then injecting it so that you mount an immune response. That actually turns out, unfortunately, to be very difficult to manufacture. And so it's not one of the ones that people have the most optimism about. The one just above it, which is uh, the company Moderna, um, actually tricks your body into manufacturing these spike proteins all by itself. No virus, but just spike proteins. And so then the body reacts to those because they're foreign and you make your antibodies. CanSino is another fascinating one. They've actually taken a cold virus and weakened it and then put a few pieces of the spike virus um, genetic material in that cold virus. And then essentially they're infecting you with this uh, very weakened cold virus that then releases material that is actually coronavirus material. So I, I, I wanted to go through that to explain the fact that there's a lot of different methods of um, uh, getting the body to react against these spike proteins. And uh, I, I really think we'll see within the next six months, several of these prove uh, to be effective. Uh, it'll be very interesting to see how long uh, their, um, the immunity lasts. I mean, we're all aware that you need a flu shot every year because the virus mutates and your immunity slowly uh, wanes uh, over uh, six months or so. Um, obviously, the hope is that with coronavirus, the vaccine, the, the idea would be that it lasts lifelong. I don't think anyone is really banking on that, but what they're banking on is that you can maybe get a shot a year, much like your flu shot, and uh, be in pretty good shape. The other things that come into play, though, are clearly manufacturing and cost. Uh, very few things that uh, come up in the world of medicine these days are low cost. And so uh, it's going to be very important that this be affordable. Last topic, because we're running out of time, I, but I do want to touch on this, is pediatric COVID-19 or, or obviously COVID in children. And that's becoming the headline uh, literally almost daily. Um, in the first two weeks of August, which is what it says under the box here, there were over 100,000 children that became positive. It is unquestionably true, and we know this now, that children are contagious. In fact, there was a study that came out yesterday saying that they actually have higher, uh, what's called titers of virus, than even uh, uh, critically ill adults. So although kids may show almost no symptoms, they have a very large amount of virus that they can spread. Uh, unfortunately, even though children are far less likely to get sick or very sick, there have been a, a huge increase in hospitalizations in children. Of the kids who end up in the hospital, one in three end up admitted to the intensive care unit. And the last thing, which is really um, the disaster for kids in particular, is that uh, COVID, as I mentioned, isn't just a disease of the lungs or respiratory tract, it's your blood vessels. And kids get this very terrible uh, inflammatory disorder of their blood vessels, which uh, can be fatal. Uh, this, unfortunately, this is the one slide I really want to see if I can, if I can get this visible. Uh, let me see if I can do this here. Uh, 
hang on, give me just a second. Um, what, what you're looking at here is time across the bottom and then age group going up. And I know it's, I apologize, it's very difficult to see. But what you see here in Florida is that the, the illness, COVID started really in Florida in the young age group and then spread to the older age. Uh, what you're seeing in Washington is our initial outbreak back in, in March up there at the top in the older age group. But what you're seeing is the, the outbreak currently being in this lower age group. And what we know, especially even in King County, is that um, it's really the under 50 year olds that are accounting for virtually all the increase in rate. Uh, everyone over the age of 50 and definitely over 60 is being very careful. There doesn't seem to be any increase in transmission. So when, when you're hearing the news stories about an increased rate, you're really talking about those under 50. But what we do know is that that spreads because it, you know people at home aren't as careful. They don't mask at home, so it spreads to family. Same thing can occur at work and in other environments. All right, I think we made it with some time for question and answer. Uh, I know that was a lot of material very fast, but I wanted to try and uh, uh, get as, as much out there as I could here. I'm gonna try in just a second here to Get this back up. Hang on. No, no. There we go. Should I just ask questions now? There okay. we go. All right. Am I on? So Great. Uh, I don't know. I haven't been watching the chat box obviously because I'm talking. I don't know if we got additional questions. Dave, you, you answered the question. The one question that came in on the chat box had to do with plasma. Uh, treatments mm -hmm. and you did cover it. There were a couple questions that that I think that would be great if you could touch a little more on having to do with people's fear of going back in for an elective surgery, uh, yeah. uh, an invasive procedure with a dentist. Um, you know, um, should we be delaying our surgeries? What 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 would be your recommendation? Sure. Thanks, Molly. So. Um, I, most places that are doing procedures, and Overlake is certainly one of them, we test everybody coming in for a procedure within 48 hours of having the procedure. And uh, if you test negative within 48 hours of the procedure and you have no symptoms at that point, um, your, the safety is very high in proceeding with it. Now, it gets a little trickier when you move out to some of the private offices in the community or dentists or periodontists. Um, but what I would suggest is that you ask them what their testing policy is, and I would strongly recommend that you advocate for everybody they see being tested within 48 hours. Um, in addition, obviously, you want everyone in that office to be masked. I have less concern about that. I could virtually guarantee you that any office at this point is masking very consistently. But the testing is a really important part of, of the safety. And so, uh, again, I would really advocate strongly for uh, asking uh, whoever, you know, whether it's a surgeon, a dentist, a periodontist, what their policy is. And honestly, if they do not test and you can't convince them to do it for everybody, I would put off elective procedures, not emergencies, but I would put off elective procedures. Okay. Uh, another question, Dave, that if you could touch on a little bit, um, uh, telemedicine. Um, how has this helped through the, through the last three months or so, and where do you see this helpful in the future? Sure. Telemedicine, no surprise, has become uh, very popular, and, and for all the right reasons. You know, there's a number of uh, medical uh, conditions that you can deal with very effectively by telemedicine, at least for the short term. Um, one of the challenges around telemedicine is uh, whether insurers or Medicare pay you uh, for it, and uh, there's been some governmental action around that to make sure that payments occur. Um, those may be extended uh, much longer. They're, I believe, extended through the end of this calendar year, um, but we're looking to see whether we can get them extended even further. Uh, the, as far as the future, I think the key is defining the subset of individuals where we can safely do telemedicine. And I think we're gonna see a lot of clarity around that in the next several months. Uh, you know, certainly somebody that comes in for a blood draw, unless there's something seriously wrong, generally, you know, follow up on, on a blood test can often be done that way. Uh, even a limited amount of dermatology, for example, uh, if you have a camera uh, and can either take a picture and send it or on your 
your video feed, you know, show your dermatologist that could be a situation where there's um, rapid growth. Uh, so, you know, the, the only caveat again is there are a number of scenarios where it's just so very important that uh, you go in and, you know, even if it's once a year and it's nothing more than blood pressure control, you want to bring your machine in, validate it against the machine in the office to make sure that they're accurate. Um, and, and so I wouldn't look at this as uh, replacing all visits, but uh, we're going to see a lot more telemedicine than we ever have. I think most, most clinics and institutions would say that uh, their two to three year plan around telemedicine uh, was condensed into a two to three month uh, time frame, and that certainly was the case at Overlake where we had, we certainly had plans and we were working on them to make this a bigger part of our repertoire, but uh, what was going to occur over years occur over months. That was, a, that was agility in action, one of our values. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, this, one, this, this question may be more for Mike. We might be able to give you a break, Dave, for a minute. How is the, effect, the pandemic affecting the, the financial situation, the bottom line here at Overlake? Well, to give you some perspective, I, um, we've had uh, about $15 million worth of uh, unreimbursed costs associated with supporting COVID patients, protecting visitors, and protecting our staff. Um, some of that, probably a small fraction, unfortunately, might be reimbursed by FEMA. We will be, we're working actively with FEMA. We were actually the first hospital in the state to get in our FEMA, get in the FEMA line with our, our first tranche of requests. Um, we haven't received anything, uh, nor do we expect to receive anything for many, many months. But in addition to that, uh, you know, so that's that's new. That's th th those are real costs. Those are unreimbursed costs. That's a signif significant amount of money. Uh, that won't be the same rate. We hope over the next six months, but um, it's it's a big number. But the even bigger number was when the governor chose to shut down non-urgent procedures. Uh, Non-urgent procedures uh, represented for that uh, two and a half month, almost three month shutdown uh, represented uh, probably about, uh, not probably, um, between 40 and $50 million worth of lost revenue. Some of that revenue has come back uh, in terms of pent up demand, uh, but some of that uh, revenue will, will never come back. And so, while you might think, well, just lower your expense base to cover that lost revenue, unfortunately, because at that time we had the greatest amount of sickness in the organization, uh, you know, we had to uh, maintain our staffing levels to support um, all of those uh, very sick COVID patients who consume an enormous amount of resources. Having said that, Overlake is very fortunate to be uh, a, um, a, a more financially um, resilient uh, organization than uh, some other hospitals in the state. Uh, I think it was reported to me that uh, 10 hospitals just recently reported to the governor's office that they have less than 40 days of cash. Uh, when you're in an environment like that and you're experiencing the kinds of um, impact, financial impact, you can imagine how frightening that might be for that community. Overlake, fortunately, is not anywhere near those circumstances. And so we have the capacity to weather through uh, this uh, very historic um, uh, event, which has very historic implications to our financial conditions. We did furlough employees, uh, employees who were less busy, uh, were not critical, essential, uh, during the heaviest portion, all of those employees have returned to work, um, and we're doing our very, very best not to uh, uh, to, to maintain our full workforce uh, as we currently have it. Okay, thank you, Mike. One final question before we wrap up, and it's about flu season. Dave, you're back on. How do you expect okay. the flu season to impact COVID incidence rates? You know, there's, it's, it's a great controversy bring about that. You know, there's, there's one feeling that uh, the, the really uh, great use of masks and social distancing and decreased travel and, and being in crowds will dramatically decrease the flu season. The, the concern is really about uh, a couple of things. One would be getting both, 
simultaneously, which the feeling is could be, you know, essentially a fatal combination. Um, the, uh, I'll switch back to the optimistic side. The optimists say that the, the focus on coronavirus and the development of the vaccine may actually improve the willingness to get a flu vaccine versus uh, lowering it. The pessimists are saying that, that it won't help. Uh, so it's a little bit all over the board. There's no question that the combination of the two would be a, a terrible uh, combination. And, and even if they're not simultaneous, but uh, follow one another, even within weeks or months, your immune system takes months to recover from either one. Most people think of the flu as a minor illness, but it's a very serious illness and your immune system takes months to recover fully. You would be at very high risk. So you'll see a very concerted effort, uh, and rightly so, to get immunized against influenza this fall. I think it's going to be even uh, more important. The optimist in me feels, though, that we're going to have a much less intense flu season because of the masking. And indeed, Australia has already uh, started their flu season and, and may even be through it, and it was very mild. So if you're looking to Australia as a harbinger of what's coming, that, that is a good omen. Uh, can you comment on the drop in mortality rates? We are, this one just, this question just came in. Um, sure. You know, the, the feeling about that is that it's a combination uh, of both the fact that we're getting our treatment regimens down. We know how to treat patients optimally. We know how to treat them in the intensive care unit. We've got a few medications in, in hand that uh, calm the immune system and the most seriously ill. But equally important is the fact that uh, COVID has switched to a much younger age group and the folks that are high risk uh, and due to any cause, whether it's age or not, um, have been very careful. As I mentioned, when we look at the numbers uh, locally, um, we're seeing no increase whatsoever in the rate among those over 50 or 60. It's 100 percent in the younger age group. Uh, so it's probably a combination of both. Very interesting, because I think we all do read a lot about that. Well, we want to be mindful of time on this end, too, and, and, um, and just thank everybody. Thank you, Dave, so much. Uh, fascinating presentation. Mike, thank you. And thanks to all of you uh, donors and corporate partners who are here um, joining us virtually. You are what helps us provide world-class care, the kind of care that we have been proud to be providing over the last few months, for sure. So thank you again. We want to continue to offer this type of informational opportunity for you to learn more about what's going on in terms of health care and related topics to Overlake. Uh, please, there'll be a survey that will, you'll get in your email box very shortly. Please let us know, A, if there are any questions that you want answers to that we didn't get to, and B, uh, topics that would be of interest for you so that we can uh, provide that type of information to you going forward. Um, you, uh, as Katie mentioned, there, this will be available on YouTube, this presentation. Send it around to others. This is great information. The more we all understand in the community, the better we'll be. Uh, we'll also send the deck around um, if, for, for anyone who wants it. So please let us know at the foundation if you're interested in seeing the hard copy of the, of the PowerPoint. Uh, that Dave spoke from. So thanks again, everybody. Uh, and again, thanks, Dave. Thanks, Mike, and all of you for helping, helping us do what we do here on the east side. Have a great weekend, and, and goodbye. <laughs>